All right, so before we begin, usually uh, we uh, take a survey of uh, who's in the audience. Um, uh, any PMs or QAs around? No. Oh, one. QA? Nice. Uh, business owners, uh, managers, anything else like that? That guy's uh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, everyone else is a developer? Sis admin? Oh. I'm a DBA. DBA. Interesting. So which part of the to Well, uh, I'm going to let me just make some changes here. Uh <laughs> didn't know the sys admins are going to be No, 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 no. So I guess uh let's see here. Ah, okay. Perfect. Well, there you go. Uh, usually, I try hope for a business owner or a uh, manager, uh, but none today. Eh? Oh, well. So, well, uh, we're going to begin. It's 3:45. Uh, my name is Tamani Tundwani. I am a customer support manager over at Pantheon. Um, this often uh, brings up the question: What exactly is that? Uh, that is um, someone who helps people get their sites onto the platform, in this case Pantheon, uh, build them, launch them, run them, and then have them deployed on our, on our, on our highly scalable matrix of uh, containers. Now, um, during the course of uh, the, the development of the support team, we started launching really big sites, and we started working with really, really, really good developers. So like the, the top shops and the top sites, sites that were getting hundreds of millions of hits per day. Um, but the truth is, it seems like a mystery when you're building small Drupal sites how you get to that level. And it's really not that hard. It is a matter of just following some set practices, sticking to them, and keeping, uh, getting a good understanding of what your application is and how it works. So basically what we had done is we put all of the, our processes and techniques into a presentation, and uh, it seemed to work really well, so here we are today. Um, we are here because I'm sure everyone at some point has seen something like this. Like your client has said to you, my site is slow. Uh, your coworker has been doing something and said, my site is slow. Uh, but for me, uh, this poses a couple of problems. Um, one, this is a statement and not a question because it ends in a period. And two, uh, it's very ambiguous. Um, slow is a general term. Uh, someone could call you up, I could call you up and say, hey, I tried to go to your website, it's slow. Well, why is it slow? I'm going over conference Wi-Fi. I'm tethering over my 3G. Uh, I'm behind a firewall that's blocking some assets on the page. It's such an ambiguous statement that it doesn't help actually get the problem solved. Now, the next problem comes in is when the developers don't understand the site or the application, and they are acting on little to no information. So every time that someone says that my site is slow, my immediate response is, is, oh my God, why? Like, why don't you tell me what is slow? How it's slow, where it's slow, when it's slow. We need the steps to replicate what is slow. And what we've found is that even when we work with our enterprise users when they're having issues of any type, the detailed information that they give us makes their tickets close faster than anyone else. It's not because that they have a higher SLA, it's because the detail that they provide allows us to execute and respond faster. Now, before you do anything, before you talk to your client, before you start getting into the email threads that go back and forth with 30 people and people are now screaming, you really need to understand the problem. Uh, what are you trying to solve? Uh, today we're going to cover this and we're also going to cover correlation between configuration and performance, uh, which metrics should we collect, defining what those are, correlating engineering efforts to business metrics, um, and uh, we also have pre present uh, metrics in a manner that stakeholders can understand and also provide traceable historic data for benchmarks. So you can't say something is slow, slower than what? Is it faster than it was before? Is it slower by a millisecond? What are you measuring? So let's take a, a quick look at what this entails. So in, in terms of answering what is this question of what problem are you trying to solve, well, first we need to understand the people who are involved in this process. The people who are going to be contributing and actually giving you input on the speed of your site. Uh, and that is a number of people. 
uh, to be honest. If you are a business or an organization, whether university or a nonprofit, what you'll find is that you'll have a number of uh, contributors. Like if I was a, working for a business owner whose job was sales, uh, he cares about the bottom dollar. So slow may not matter to him today, slow will matter to him in 30 days when he doesn't get what he's expecting in revenue. Uh, you know, the project managers, they need to also understand that they need to follow best pra practices, they need to guide their develop developers the right way, uh, you know, and also keep track of what's going on. Uh, if you're the developer, uh, the best practices should be like the back of your hand. You should understand when someone is complaining about something, what it is, and potential places that you can make enhancements to reduce this pain. Um, it may sound strange, but marketing is also included in this. Um, the business owner cares about his money. Uh, the marketing campaigns help generate this by generating ads and other you know, click-throughs and things like that. So it is important to also get input from them, what they're expecting. Uh, you'll find out that marketing would like to put 500 ads on a page, which also makes things slow. Uh, so sometimes you need to have a trade-off and a balance, and that's something that you have to do as a team rather than having the developers advocate anything. So when it comes to project management, uh, we always look at the, uh, the triangle. Um, you know, and they say you can't have two, uh, you can't have three, but you can have two. Uh, in our belief, you can have three. And it's all a matter of process. Um, you know, projects need to be on time. Uh, there are deadlines that are set, uh, and these deadlines are tied to all of the stakeholders involved. So being on time is critical. Uh, some of these sites have fixed deadlines and they can't move. Uh, there are launches, they're set for Independence Day and things like that. So the day tomorrow won't work. They need it to work today. Um, so some of those requirements are really tough. But the reality is, if you're on these teams, you have a say. If it's not time to go, it is better for you not to let things happen than to let them happen and die and fail. Failure is the worst thing that you can have because the taste never leaves anyone's mouth. Uh, cost, um, you need to have uh, an understanding of what this is going to cost you. Uh, the business owner may want to have a million and two hundred sales in a day. Uh, it's just not cost efficient. You can scale that many servers. You don't have access to those resources. You need to temper those expectations. And scope. Um, this is, again, working with the marketing, sales, and all these other departments to get a good plan for scope so that you don't creep over and don't miss your deadlines. Scope creep is definitely one of the main reasons for people missing their deadlines whenever we see it. Uh, you know, we have uh, a number of uh, tools and uh, systems that we use uh, for workflow, and uh, we, really t we really must emphasize that repeatable task that you can then delegate to people in a really sane and uh, coherent manner is important. Forget email. Anyone still coordinating projects through email is in for trouble. So avoid that. We use uh, Rike to manage our projects. Uh, we use Jira uh, for other projects. And we also uh, you know, integrate. We use Trello for different things as well. People use Redmine. There are other ones that are, exist, Pivotal Tracker, and so on. Uh, we have regular meetings. Um, never do we go more than three business days without talking to someone about something. So sometimes we'll get on a call and it'll be five minutes and they'll study it's nothing. You should never let things get to a point that a problem is now a problem. You should catch it at its early stages and that way it'll allow you to be nimble and adjust accordingly. The longer things go, the harder they are to fix and the more trouble they are and the more they cost. Um, you also want to have a really good scheduling system uh, as well as real-time communication. Uh, the value of face-to-face -face communication is beyond words. Uh, emails may relate the same content, but even looking through at someone uh, via the web conference is the difference. Uh, it'll allow them to get peace of mind. They understand that they're talking to a person and you're not just some machine that is auto-responding. Uh, we also encourage training. Uh, I shouldn't skip over that. Training is extremely important. Documentation, uh, I, I worked at dev shops, I've worked at organizations I, where we built large sites for media properties and movie studios, and very rarely anything was documented and it was a nightmare. So um, get good documentation so that when new people start, they can onboard faster and the process of launching sites does not become so cumbersome, but is easier to deal with. Now that you have this team, um, you want to delegate responsibilities. Everyone should know what they're doing and when and how they should respond in various situations. Um, the next one for me is extremely important, and this is defining emergency procedures. 
Uh, I would say about 99% of the sites that launch, uh, or maybe 98, do not have any emergency procedures in place. So uh, we're talking about backups. Uh, what happens if your site goes down, how frequently are you backing up, what type of data do you have, um, defining how your business owner responds. Sending an all caps email to everyone in the company is recipe for disaster, and then it just spirals. You know, marketing starts complaining, the sysadmins are not happy, the DBA is saying what's going on, marketing is saying our campaign is toast, people are crying, and it's just the worst. So be proactive and stay in touch with that. Um, and here's where the meat of this is. If you are a developer and you want to improve how your general process and workflow is, follow best practices. We're going to cover just the high-level ones, and then I'm going to hand off to Christoph, and he's going to talk a bit more of an example of uh, these in practice. But configuration, uh, we're going to look at best practices. Uh, we're talking about fixing your 404 errors. I have seen sites go from, you know, 15 seconds response time because of three 404s on external services to fixing them and going to sub one second. Um, and you think this is a small difference. Uh, that was about 15 seconds or so. Um, we'll actually take a look at what some uh, fractions of a second results uh, in terms of what your results are for your company and your business. Uh, block caching, uh, a must. Uh, Drupal is a very advanced system, and it is complex. Uh, leverage caching wherever possible. We are not going to go into detail in any of these. We're just going to breeze over them for now. The other presentation does that, but not this one. Uh, aggregate your CSS and JavaScript. Uh, Google Web Developers, Yahoo, they have a set of best practices they recommend, one of which is reducing the overall aggregate size, and aggregating CSS is uh, a really good idea. Similar to real life, uh, the heavier your page, the harder it is for the clients or the browser to render it. So if I handed you a 60-ton weight and asked you to carry it, you'd have a different time if I handed you a feather. So make things as light as possible. They allow you to be as responsive as possible. Uh, database, make sure you have the correct storage engine. Uh, if anyone has my ISAM, um, be sure you actually need my ISAM and, and well, you know what it needs to do. If you don't, uh, InnoDB is the default. You should stick with it. Um, memory caching is a big one. Drupal is really, uh, it, it allows the flexibility to cache on and off uh, between, um, between uh, the database and other areas. Uh, if you start to see cache tables dominating your, uh, your new relic traces, then you probably want to look at in-memory caching, Redis, memcache, and others. Uh, disable unused modules. Um, in this instance, uh, usually would look at uh, statistics and all of the other modules that people use. Statistics generates a query on every page load. That means a database transaction. That means if someone wanted to purchase something, they can't because now you're logging statistics, which you'll never look at. The tracker module is similar. Color box loads some uh, JavaScript files. And if you're not using it, it's just a waste of time. So disable unused modules. Again, we've seen remarkable increases in speed just from this alone. It's because sometimes these modules cause errors, which cause rendering problems. Uh, we also have caching on the front end. Uh, this will most probably be the difference once you have maxed out your uh, Drupal configuration, the biggest bang for buck. Uh, there is a graph where we show a site going from 10 uh, requests uh, per minute to about 500 requests per minute um, after we turn on Varnish. So you can see that's a big jump in traffic, uh, number of orders of magnitude. Uh, what to expect during and after? Um, benchmark and benchmark offered. We're going to see the value of this very soon. Um, it doesn't matter. Don't look at any complex systems. Uh, the initial graphs that we did to the, for this in hand to our clients are in spreadsheets. Uh, I can gladly share the spreadsheet and how we track configuration and changes over time. And uh, everyone should definitely do that. You should also, as I said, be reasonable so you can manage those expectations. And let numbers dictate what you're doing and not just what you feel. Google Analytics will help you drill down into this. Um, and you can kind of calculate your concurrent usage from your analytics. Uh, again, the full slides which we'll post will have that. And how you, there's a formula you can use. Uh, you can take the number of visitors that you get, the uh, actual visits. That includes you know, more than the same user clicking on five, six, seven pages. Um, you'll then use the actual duration of the time that they're on site. Uh, something people don't think about is the think time. No one browses a site and clicks really rapidly. You want to have these staggers so that they actually mimic the think time of your users. 
define your environment configuration. As things change, as you make changes and enhancements, you want to know when you change something, what is the effect? If you change the PHP version, what happens? If you change the APC shim size, what's going on? If you have extensions going on, are they contributing to it? How big is your uh, in-memory cache size and your general memory? What is that footprint? Uh, next, you should also have a strategy to test, and as I said, we're going to look a bit about that, and just simple spreadsheets can get you part of the way, and there's a lot to do uh, to get you the full way. Uh, next, the question is what metrics should we collect? And usually this is why I like the business owners, because we rattle these off and they have no idea what they mean, and then at the end, they start to make sense. So for example, uh, we recommend if you're debugging your application, split it into back-end and front-end metrics. Uh, they are very distinct, their traits are dist uh, distinct and different, and the, the steps you'll take to debug and diagnose and fix problems are definitely not the same. So separate them. Uh, maybe I'll do something later if people want to do something with New Relic and actually look at how to analyze that, we can actually do that. Uh, but look at requests per second, uh, basically how much traffic can you handle uh, in, a, uh, in a second. Uh, the average of response time, uh, the browser load time, the total number of requests over the duration of the test, whatever it may be, the data received, the size, the overall weight of the page, uh, and most importantly, the errors. The error rate can kill you, and you'll soon see why. Uh, Front-end metrics, uh, you should check the load time. This is the time that it takes the page to appear, the first byte, uh, when there's a communication from the client to the server, how long does it take to go from me to you and back to me again? This is different than the time that it starts to render because your JavaScript may be writing it to the DOM and breaking everything or delaying the writes to the page or the client. Uh, reduce the number of DOM elements. You don't need 500 ads. They will kill you, as I said. Uh, fully loaded time and the fully loaded number of requests. And I will end here and just so you guys can see um, prior to implementing any of this, uh, when we used to have enterprise users, as you can see, the, um, the red line is kind of jagged. Uh, it, it keeps on going up. It's uh, around four, five tickets that we used to get uh, on average per day. Uh, now when we front load things and, uh, and do things the right way from the beginning, uh, there's the initial process of finding out what those problems are. And then the blue line, as you see, tapers off until we basically never hear from them again and they launch more sites, and that's the ultimate goal, that you guys get to the point that you're doing this, but it does require following some best practices. Uh, next, I'm going to give it over to Christoph, who's going to give us a real-world example uh, as a partner of what this looks like and the end results. All right, thank you. So um, the point I want to make is that you ought to look not just at your metrics, um, you know, how, how well your web server works and how well your Drupal site works, but also what it is supposed to do and whether it's actually meeting the goal that you set for yourself while you, while you uh, develop the website. Um, so in my business, in my company, uh, we serve up ads for the most part um, on our pages um, and together with the information, and that is the income for us as a business. So. For us, ad click-through is the business metric that we look at most because that basically defines uh, whether we generate income from our sites and whether it, uh, it, it warrants investing into the sites. So here's an example of a site that we had a chance to rebuild. The f on the left, you have the Drupal 6 version um, that was built badly. And on the right is the Drupal 7 version. Same look and feel overall, but while we rebuilt it, we took advantage of d redoing the theme entirely. Um, in the old version, it took 1.6 seconds until a user saw something on the page. Um, in the new version, it takes 0 0.9 seconds until you see something, and the page is visually complete at 1.2 seconds. After that, a few more things happen that are actually invisible. Some JavaScript loads, we do the Google Analytics and all that crud that really doesn't matter to your site visitor. Um, that made an enormous difference. Um, so, and then you also need to go back and talk with your stakeholders, especially the business owners with the marketing folks and make that case of, you know, why are we doing this? What does it give us? And you have to present it to them in some really meaningful way. So this is a, a relatively hard graph, um, but once, once you look at it closer, it, it's much more clear. The, 
On the far left, the blue line is our new site. So once you sort of start to, to get to the 0 0.3 second timeline, pretty much all of the page comes in. And then the JavaScript gets interpreted, and by the time we're at, it actually shifted uh, at the time we launched. We had to do a bit more work on this. Um, but uh, let's just say it, it, this line is pretty much at 0.9 seconds these days. At that point, you get all on the page that you need, and the page is more or less rendered. So you, it's front-loaded, if you will. Whereas on the old site, that happened much later. That's the second blue line, and you only got about half, and then the, the rest trickles in slowly, which means your visitors don't get to see as much early on as they should, and you, uh, you lose their engagement, and at the end of the day, you lose the actual action you want from them, which in our case is an ad click. If for you it may be getting more readers, may having them read to the bottom, or click on an offer, or whatever the case may be, right? So, and what's also important is that you keep tracking this stuff over time so that you know which changes made a real impact to the site. And, and you sort of get a picture. So here is a spreadsheet that I maintain for this particular uh, site, and I went way back so that I get some historical, um, some historical uh, data. But what I want you to focus on is the time frame from last summer, 07, 2013, uh, up until now. So the old version was in action all the way up to here. Um, in blue are the actual um, ad clicks. In red is the click-through rate which on the old version of the site was right around 1.2%, um, and, um, and then jumped up to about 25 or thereabouts percent. Um, in orange is the actual income that the site generates every month. So what we did with the theme layer is we reduced the number of ads shown to half, uh, which actually reduces the number of elements in, on our page, and, and, um, and it gives a bit more space to the actual content. But because the site is faster, we have this jump in ad click-through rate. It basically doubled, which means with half the ads, we're making the same income. And what also happens is you see that the income actually starts creeping up in the new version of our site. There's two reasons for that. One is that we can sell the ads for higher prices. And number two, because of the better user engagement, it's not just a click-through rate, but they're actually clicking more on the targets that we would really like them to click. So for us as a business, by re-engineering the site, we've actually made it perform better for the user, but we've made it also perform better for ourselves as a business, both, right? So it's sort of a win-win situation. It really made our marketing folks very happy. So, but the important thing here is engineering at a very fundamental level has a very direct influence on a company bottom line or on the success of your blog site or whatever your metric of success is. And I think that's the important take home message. You're trying to get the engineering perfect is not existing in a vacuum. It exists in the context of a bigger environment, whether that's business oriented or doing good out in the world. But your site being fast and cool and great is, is serving that bigger purpose, and if you engineer it right, it will serve that purpose better as well. So, back to you. Thank you very much, Christoph. So, um, earlier we talked about sites that were, you know, even at five seconds, uh, even at three and a half seconds, what the difference is. Um, they basically doubled uh, just in 0.03. So um, that's the end for now. Uh, definitely open to questions, uh, either me or Christoph, if you uh, are, uh, if you have any uh, anything about their experience doing this. Um, but again, all they were doing was just following the outlined best practices, and it ended up paying off. So thank you very much. Uh, we have to give credit to Christoph and uh, here is his information if anyone wants to talk to him. Uh, here is his uh, user ID on Drupal.org, uh, his user number uh, ID. And uh, as well as his information. Uh, and you can find him on LinkedIn, uh, Christoph Weber. And then we also can find us at Pantheon at Get Pantheon, or you can find us on Freenode um, or online at Get Pantheon. 
Um, there are a couple of versions of these slides. Uh, we'll post these, but you can click on this link. It'll take you to the ones that are on SlideShare, uh, which are a bit more snazzy and got more fancy graphs. And that's it. So uh, we have about five minutes for questions. Uh, anyone have any? Did you say you have the SlideShare shared already? Yes. So um, there are a couple of versions, and I'll see if I can get some notes up. Uh, so this version will be on the Drupal.org uh, Austin website. Uh, you can click on the link at the end. That will take you to the SlideShare version. Uh, there is also the other version where we go more in-depth into, like, configuration and we have some graphs and metrics similar to Christoph's that actually we you can take to the business owner and say configuration change A versus B result in Y. We need more resources for, you know, Z. And that way you don't just walk in there and say we need more money. And they say, well, we need more money too. So, you know, <laughs> that's sometimes how it goes. Um, anyone else with any questions? I have one more question. So, more for Okay. So, started at the company uh, not too long ago. The response time on the page was about six to seven seconds. Um, we did a lot of performance tuning, added caching. I did some load testing, JMeter, um, all that kind of stuff, and brought it down to within two seconds. Um, there isn't really a very easy way of justifying the effort that was spent in getting to that point. Now, we know that the customers give us good feedback, but there is no uh, hard ROI that we can compute, besides looking at our past experience and what's happening now. Right. Um, there's data out there, actually. If you look at um, Steven Souter's talks, um, he's the performance guy at Google. Um, the, he, defer, he defined an, ID, an LD50, which means LD50 is a term from toxicology, which means when you give that dose of a, of a toxin to a lab rat, 50% of the population will die. So in, in web performance uh, terms, this means if your page loads uh, during X seconds, 50% of your visitors will fall off, right? And they will basically stop at that page and abandon, and they will not go any further, or will maybe not even look at the first page. And that's basically, if you look at Google Anal Analytics, that's, uh, that's your bounce rate, right? Um, so. Your LD50 on a web page in 2011 was four and a half seconds, meaning if your site takes four and a half seconds or longer to deliver a page, especially the crucial pages that you're interested in, in 2011 you lost half of your audience already. Now it's 2014, I'm willing to bet that we're somewhere around three and a half seconds or lower. And yeah, in my company we have a hard and fast rule and that was at a basically issued by the CEO not by myself, who heads up the, the, the uh, tech team, um, that no site will launch if crucial pages are more than two seconds to load. Um, so there's data out there that shows what these trends are and how they've evolved over time. But maybe you can come up with a metric that defines success for yourself, you know, whether that's number of page views or anything else, and you can track that over time. Okay. So that's actually, uh, like, like he was saying, that's actually a good point. You have to define the metrics and what those are going to be, right? So uh, why, did you, why did you actually start fixing the sites? Who asked for that? Well, uh, so I, I, uh, like I said earlier, I'm, I'm really a DBA, it was, yeah. and I have experience in the past with working on load testing and stuff like that. So I just happened to, nobody really was asking for it. Ah. I wanted to do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, in a case like that, I think it's one of those things where if you if you track what it was before, like like we had the when you was tracking it when it was low, and then you you find out what marketing wants for them from the site or what the company is looking to get from the site, and then you track those metrics. Like in in their case, it was the the click through rate and the revenue that they're getting from ads. I guess you'd have to quantify it for your case, and it's the type of thing that if it was the bounce rate affecting some sort of sales or conversions. Then if you track those over time from when it was low or higher and what it is now, then that's what you present. So I guess the next time you do it, you can gather the stakeholders or anything else, anyone else, figure out what they want, 
then you say, I gave you what you want, and if there's other things that you need to make things better, they will then be able to provide it for you. Like the graphs over here are really compelling, okay. and like the business owner may not know what requests per second are, but he knows what money is, and he knows what doubling his money is, and so he'll care. Okay. So. Thank you. Thank you for this. But really, yeah, it, it, it all comes down that you, as a whole team, define what is success for us, which numbers define our success. You really have to boil it down to uh, two or three numbers, and those need to be tracked at the same time as you're tracking your performance, and then you plot them on the same graph, and then you're basically home free, because then you can say, oh, we did X, and look what happened for the other metric. It went up, or it went down, and then, oops, you know, we have a regression. We need to fix it. Well, I think that's time. We're at 30 minutes exactly, so thank you very much. Same thing in foreground and stay Can here. Do the I feel like I should be speeding up my website right now, not giving this talk. <laughs> All right. Let us get started. Uh, my name is Andrew Wilson. I am the Senior Account Manager at Drupalize Me. Uh, if you don't know Drupalize Me, we are the leader in online training in the Drupal space. Um, our parent company is Lullabot, and Lullabot is uh, one of the top agencies here in the Drupal space. We are both located downstairs on the trade show floor, come say hello. I've been told that I'm not supposed to sell anything during this session, though. Um, so that's it for the business side. Um, as the senior account manager at Drupalize Me, I spend my time heading up sales and marketing, uh, which means I spend a lot of time thinking about strategy. And that leads us to my presentation today about vocational education, professional certificates, and Drupal. Well, let's get started. Um, today's agenda, what am I going to talk about? I'm going to give a really brief introduction of vocational education, uh, what it's all about, uh, the past and, and the future, what it looks like today, uh, professional certificates, and what those are, uh, Drupal certification, which is very new, and uh, draw some quick conclusions. So first off, vocational education. Um, the OECD in 2010 defined it as what you see up here, education designed for and typically leading to a particular job or type of job. It normally involves practical training as well as the learning of relevant theory. It is distinct from academic education. Um, vocational education is known by a few different names. There is um, technical and vocational education, career and technical education, which is actually the official name right now defined by the OECD. Whatever you want to call it, um, it is education for your career. It is specific to things that you'll be doing on the job. And it started, uh, at least in the United States, I'm going to be speaking about the United States primarily, 
this afternoon. It started in the 1860s uh, with the land grant institutions and an act of Congress. Uh, they created agriculture and manufacturing institutions. Think of uh, Texas A&M, for instance, as an example of that. Um, all throughout history, um, whether it's reflected in, in what we see today, there's been a dualism in education reform and literature. This concept that connecting academic and career education together is the best form of education. Um, we haven't really made it that far. You can look at uh, Ivy League institutions as an example. Some of the more elite academic institutions in the United States, they stopped after um, medicine, law, uh, theology. Uh, they considered those more learned in terms of career prep, um, and that's what they provide. So that's where we are. Um, Nevertheless, uh, that's not where we're going. Uh, globalization is absolutely revolutionizing education um, for the better, I would think. Uh, but that's, I guess, opinion and up to everyone here. What it's doing is as other countries around the world are able to compete based on wage, low wages, um, we are forced, OECD countries, um, the first world countries to use um, that term, they need to compete on the quality of goods and services. And quality goods and services require uh, skilled labor. And skilled labor ultimately requires uh, higher professional and technical skills, which um, is something that vocational education is certainly promoting. Um, so that's where we're at. And the trend is only going to continue as globalization increases, um, and there's demand in the marketplace for these technical skills. Drupal is a great example. Um, there is high demand for talented Drupal developers. Um, and that is your crash course in vocational education. Congratulations. All right, professional certificates, moving on. They only gave me a half hour here. Um, what are professional certificates? Who has one? Does anybody have one? Really? <laughs> Nobody? <laughs> All right. Well, let me, let me give you an example here. Exactly. So let's define it. Um, I completed some courses in Google Analytics, right? They gave me a completion certificate. Technically, that's a, an example of a not very well-developed professional certificate. Um, it states that I have some degree of competency, um, at least according to that certificate, in that particular area. The, um, the best way to think of a professional certificate, though, is it's a form of currency. It's literally uh, like the dollar that you have in your pocket. Um, you are able to trade that. Um, you're, you're able to use it to trade your skills for benefits in the labor market, the benefits being jobs. So that professional certificate is going to help you out. Um, it's not a requirement by any means, but it's definitely something that can prove helpful. Um, one of the big characteristics or top characteristics of a professional certificate is uh, the same thing with money. Uh, again, currency is durability. And with, dur with currency, that durability is not necessarily, you know, the strength of the paper money. You can rip it or you can't rip it. It's, it's the trust, actually, behind it. It's the faith. So, you know, if you ask yourself the question, why do I trust this dollar, this $5 bill? Uh, it's ultimately because people have trust in the government that's behind it, um, some degree of trust. And, and when that trust uh, ebbs and flows, you see the actual value of the currency changing. It's similar to professional certificates. Let's take a ex look at a few examples. I'm looking at non-technical examples right now because um, we look at a lot of tech stuff here. There are numerous certifications out there in the world. and. One of the things, again, jumping back to the last slide, trust, um, when you're looking at them, think to yourself, do I trust this certificate more than another? And why is that? Do you trust the Red Cross? And, and likewise, what does that tell you about the CPR certification that they have? Or you know, if you've bought an engagement ring, you've heard of the GIA, do you have, would you have more trust in someone that was GIA certified than someone who wasn't? Just something to think about. Uh, professional certificates in IT. Here are a couple. Um, again, do you trust any of these over 
another. If you walked into a store and you needed to have your Apple computer worked on and the person had an Apple certified um, or was an Apple certified technician, would you trust them more than someone that was not Apple certified? Especially if you're, they're working on an Apple product. Um, just think about it. Zend is interesting. Zend has a PHP developer certification, right? So Zend is a private company. Um, well, it's not as simple as this. They don't they don't own PHP. PHP is open source. Um, however, they have a certification for PHP. Sound familiar? Yes. No. Um, Acquia certification. Here we are. This was announced in, on March the 20th of 2014. Um, everyone's been talking about it at DrupalCon, which is awesome. It's um, a certification for Drupal. I, I noted Zend. It's very similar to that, right? Acquia does not own Drupal. Drupal is open source, but there is a certification for Drupal, um, the, the Acquia certified developer. Um, if you look at the training material, it, it, it's specific to, uh, or excuse me, the test for the certification is specific to Drupal. Um, upon the announcement of the certification program, uh, Dries reiterated something. Dries Bytart, the, everyone knows Dries. Do I have to? Okay, great. Um, he reiterated something that he had stated uh, in a blog post from 2009. Um, where, where he said, it's my belief that we are best served by allowing many organizations to create their own Drupal certification programs and have the marketplace set their value. Um, and I, <laughs> so I told you earlier, I like strategic analysis and all that. So I started thinking about this. And I was wondering, well, what, what value will the market place on a Drupal certification? Um, so I, I went and started to look into a lot of research about it, um, and there, there's, there's stuff out there not necessarily specific to um, professional certificates, but there's a lot concerning education generally and consumer uh, perceptions of nonprofits and for-profits generally. So there was a big study back in 2010 uh, by the University of Chicago looking at uh, consumer behavior related to their perception or their stereotypes of a for-profit or a non-profit. It was a really big study. The big conclusion that was uh, identified is that people see non-profits as being warm. What does that mean? Um, if you dig into the details, it actually means that there's a good deal of trust that they have for non-profits over for-profit institutions. Um, and, and somehow that they decided warmth was the best uh, adjective there. But trust underlied much of that. There was also um, a Google commissioned a big study about uh, for-profits in education. And this was really interesting because um, when they ranked private, public, community, and for-profits for all of these characteristics across the board, um, the ones that ranked lowest, again, trustworthiness, tended to be uh, the for-profit institutions. So what does this mean um, for the Acquia Drupal certification? Um, one, it, it, consumers generally trust nonprofits. Um, in the education space, consumers generally do not trust for-profits. Um, it means that Acquia has an uphill battle with these Drupal certifications. Um, again, I stated vocational education is heading in this direction. Professional certificates are, are definitely going to be no, the norm here for us, whether we like that or not. Um, but nevertheless, there's still a, an uphill battle ahead of us. Um, ultimately, the market's going to place lower value on a certification that has been created by a for-profit versus one that's created by a nonprofit. And interestingly enough, on some level, Dries, again, understands this. He wrote in that same blog post, a certification, of course, is ultimately only as valuable as the organization standing behind it, which is very true. And it's what's seen in, in looking at currency and things like that. I work with, with Dries regularly, um, Tom, uh, Erickson, Ben Ortega, who helped develop this program. I commend them for everything they've done. They're leading the way 
uh, in certification, um, in, in, in just telling the Drupal community that this is something that is needed. They, you know, they took the first step. So I, I, I truly commend everything that they've been doing. Um, but I also believe that research shows that our currency, this Drupal certification in the Drupal community, needs to be administered, run, um, attached to a nonprofit organization. Um, I would argue that that organization should be the Drupal Association, but I think that um, is also up for discussion as well. Um, so that's it. What do you think? Who else has opinions on the matter? There's a microphone right there. I see some hands. I love this. So yes. where does Microsoft fit into all that? It's a great question. So, so Microsoft, for those certifications, they're, they're certifying people on their proprietary implementation. So they are actually judged as the, the best source for that information um, for their proprietary products, right? They built it. They know it. Apple built the software and the hardware. They know it. Um, in this instance, it's a little bit fuzzier, right? Does, does Acquia build Drupal? No, they do a lot, certainly. They definitely do. Um, so are they the best organization to have the certification for it? It's, it's a question. So I really have two comments. Please. Um, I, I head up a team. I, I'm part of the hiring process. I don't make the ultimate decision, but I make a lot of the evaluation. Mm -hmm. So if someone comes to an interview and says, I'm certified or I'm not certified, quite frankly, right now, I don't give a damn. <laughs> in fact, I think if they're certified, they may actually be slower. And the guy who comes to me and looks like he or a girl who's really eager and like right in there, I think, oh, they have it in them to really step up to the plate. And within three months' time, I've got the best person. Um, and they're probably good from maybe not day one, but let's say day five or so on. Um, Whereas I'm not quite sure about the person who just doggedly pursues the path of I'm getting these certificates and I'm putting this next to my name on my business card and who, who cares, right? So I'm, I'm not really a believer in it just yet. Um, but I see some value in them. So I'm, I'm sort of, you know, I'm torn at the moment. Um, but I certainly, myself, I would never go and earn one. I don't see the value in that for myself at all. what you're talking about is, I'm not as tall as you. Uh, it's kind of like the early 2000s when everybody came out and just started getting certified in, in Microsoft products and Oracle products. And, and I used to work in a IBM shop and it was, you had to get as many certifications as you could. And so the value of those certifications kind of weren't as important very much because everybody was getting those certifications. So I kind of with you. I, at this point in time, I don't know how valuable the certification will be just because of what happened about 10 years ago, I think. Yeah, it, it's an excellent point. A lot of this is obviously based on the notion that the trend is towards certification. And if you look at a lot of research, it seems like that is where we're headed, whether that's in a year or 10 years or 25 years or never is a good question, right? Will that ever matter? Um, it's also important to, to think um, outside of the Drupal community and people trying to enter. Um, you know, we know that um, so-and-so worked at, at Pantheon and knows all about scaling websites and all that, but there, there are new entrants all the time and we don't necessarily know about them. And do professional certificates help us know a little bit more? Does that reduce the burden on the hire um, in terms of time and money to vet potential new hires? glad you mentioned that because that brings me to my second thing. If somebody comes to me into the interview and says, so I've been on DrupalEyes.me and I've, col I've completed these videos because I wanted to know, you know, that to me has some value because I know I'm probably not going to have to cover those things with that person or maybe only slight polish. Whether they pass a test afterwards, I really don't care that much. But if they tell me, 
uh, make me believe that they've actually done the stuff. That in itself has value. And maybe a completion certificate of, say, your series of vid videos would have some worth in itself also. And maybe there's, there are ways that you can track whether they've had the whole video play or just you know started watching <laughs> the first two minutes before you tell, yeah, that person has watched it. Whether they really looked at the screen, that's a whole other ball game. They but did it or not. If, if somebody tells me I did it and then comes back and has no clue, I mean, there's a 90-day thir a period during which we fire, right? <laughs> OK. <laughs> Thank you for your comments. Are you guys planning on offering certification? Thank you for asking that. At, at this point in time, I can't, well, I can't speak for the team. At this point in time, there's no, there's nothing in the plans. Um, in terms of what we do in the future, I, I don't know. Uh, cer uh, excuse me, completion certificates certainly seem like the easy first step, uh, but it's an excellent question. Do you envision anyone else in, uh I guess I'm not fully aware of your competitors, uh, but as far as I know, Aqua is the only one that's offering anything Drupal certification related right now, right? No? Who else does? OS. Who? OS training. OS training. It offers a gotcha. certification. Okay. Is that? that? I was cool. unfamiliar with that, but it sounds. Just curious. Cle completion certificate. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and, and again, back to. Uh, Dries's comment about it, um, he's certainly hoping that others do create um, certifications of some sort and that the market will set their value. Hi, I'm, I'm Gwendolyn Anello with Drupal Easy and we run career training programs for Drupal um, and actually have um, started the program down in Florida uh, to help unemployed space center workers after they canceled the shuttle program. Um, and I, I, um, I, I work a lot in the workforce world and in the education world, and I realize within the Drupal community there's a lot of, of controversy over this. Um, but from outside the Drupal community, I, I can't tell you like how helpful it would be to have certification. Um, whenever I make presentations to people in the education world and the government world, um, it takes me like three quarters of my presentation before I can even start talking about Drupal because I have to start explaining what open source is and why there are no certifications. And to answer like your comment, um, I think it would be best if it was through the Drupal Association, um, but I think because it's such a controversial issue, it's good that such a major, major player in the market has stepped up to do something like this. Um, and I also think we need to recognize that this is not a U.S.-based um, problem that they were solving. Certifications are uh, much more uh, regar highly regarded, I think, in, um, especially in Europe. Um, and so I, I think what they were trying to do is, you know, if, there, if there's not this, you know, mass, uh, you know, kumbaya over certifications in the community, um, they as an organization stepped up to do it. So I, it would absolutely be best if it was through the Drupal Association. I mean, if we're going to have a certification through the Drupal Association, but um, I, I, don't, I don't know if that's possible at this point. Thank you. I'm kind of a, a unique beast that, you know, the people we serve are a K-12 community. Okay. So I deal with vocational schools, I deal with schools, and a lot of the schools have some sort of web development classes that they, they, they have in their curriculum, uh, especially the vocational schools. I mean, we've got Cisco training, and then we also have this other, but there's really no certification for the web development people. So they're you know, to, to look at your portfolio or my portfolio, I, I think it speaks for itself. Those who've been doing this for six, eight years, oh, yeah, <laughs> this is a collection of my work. But for those who are coming into, um, my understanding is that Acqui is also going, they're developing a massive online open curriculum as well. And that might be something as far as, you know, for us to go in there and say, no, 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 I took the test, big deal. But for somebody to, who knows a little bit about the web and HTML to delve into Drupal for the first time, uh, to take a, an online class like that as part of a high school vocational program makes sense as far as a first step into it, and to have a certification that says, I understand the basics. But beyond that, you know, it's really your resume, your, your, the, the work speaks for itself. I mean, you walk in and you can either do it or you can't. And I, when you hire people, 
uh, a lot of it's attitude and, and what they're capable of learning on their own. All of us, I think, are self-directed learners. We sit down and we learn because we like to. And those who show up with 10 certificates and say, I know everything there is to know, I'd say, well, let's find <laughs> out. <laughs> but uh, sure. for, for what it's worth, I, I think there, there is a need for this, uh, especially to get a lot of new um, blood into the community. And maybe the K-12 market and the vocational education market might be a good fit for it. Thank you very much. Kind of adding to what he was talking about earlier with portfolios and uh, certifications, I was wondering in, in your own research if you've seen any correlation or relationships with regard to quality of uh, portfolio and quality of like certifications. Like I'm just kind of curious also if just from this crowd, you know, if you were to choose between two developers, would you choose someone, you know, with a better portfolio or a better set of certifications? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Actually, a lot of the literature is focused on that. You know, what can a professional certificate of any type actually tell us? Can it tell us that this person is an expert? No, it, it cannot. Ultimately, that's a matter of their work experience, their resume, what they've done, you know, what they can show. Um, what it can say is that they're at, or they should know at least this amount of information. Um, whether that means they can apply it well or they can think critically, you know. Um, and it should not necessarily, as a result, ever be needed to replace things like work experience. But it can be used in combination with that to get a foothold of some sort. Um, hi, I just, I actually have two points I wanted to say. One was more of a statement, which is I, I think um, a couple of people have, have commented about whether or not the Drupal Association should be a source of um, certifications. And I think that that is, um, it seems like an intuitive, natural place to put that. But at the same point, it's completely wrong um, because the Drupal Association is meant to actually be there to support the entire Drupal community. And by putting the Drupal Association in a place where it is certifying people, you're actually having the Drupal Association say who's a good person and who's a bad person and making a judgment call on people. And that's, in my opinion, really destructive in their role to support the entire community. I Thank you. I appreciate the... The comment, because it's um, the discussion is important, I think. And, and I don't necessarily believe, um, and I hope it doesn't come across like this, that Aku was wrong in creating their certification. I think no, they, I, don't, I don't think I think they, they yeah. did a really great job. And maybe there's a role um, for partnering or something like that, or a different yeah. thing that I'm not even considering right now, right? Um, so I appreciate that. Thank you. So th that kind of leads into my next thing. And I apologize. I was a bit late to this. <laughs> no, this no worries, but, please. Um, I'm kind of curious to hear any comments that you guys that you have on <coughs> something like certified to rock or some sort of data driven metrics around um, those kind of things. <laughs> I would actually push that back to to everyone else. I I I haven't studied a certified to rock based on someone's skills enough to comment on. So I I'd rather not. I <laughs> does anyone would Okay, so um, Certified to Rock is a um, system basically that analyzes um, all of your Drupal.org data from your profile, um, your commits, your um, forum posts, those kind of things. And there's, yeah, I should. It's it's a, it's a hidden metric. So um, the algorithm of what all of that data turns into um, is not necessarily uh, known. Um, but the idea is that then based off of that data, um, you can then kind of give people a bit of a score about their involvement in the community and, and to some extent use it as a metric as in terms of their experience and, and knowledge level. Um, but, yeah, um, I guess it, and maybe I can get you to comment in a more general sense about the idea of using data-driven metrics to actually evaluate people, maybe not necessarily specifically certified to rock, um, and sure. I should probably clarify, um, I'm actually in the process of reworking Certified to Rock. Um, so that's why I'm also really curious about any okay. ideas people have on this concept. Interesting. Yeah, um, I am a huge data 
guy. I mean, I when I'm looking at certification, what the market's going to think about the Aquia certification, I look to the research. I look to what the data shows. Um, and I think ultimately it goes back to the marketplace setting the value on certified to rock. Um, and is that value higher or lower than a different type of certification? Um, but the, sort of the badge concept is really intriguing to me as a, you know, they've, they have this certified to rock badge. That means something, right? And, and let the market determine what that means. Sort of hogging the microphone here. Uh, but <laughs> I wanted to go back to an, a couple of issues that the guy who just left raised is, you know. Well, that's not fair. Are you can't. <laughs> are institutions prepping the people right? I recently had an open front end developer and a designer position open. And some of the applicants came in through the Art Institute. Those guys really trained their people to work on their resumes, get their personal brand out there. Actually, I'm carrying a pen that I received from a candidate during the interview in, in my bag. So, you know, looking at this polished resume and sort of maybe the portfolio was minimal, but the resume was top notch. And that gets them a foot in the door very clearly, whereas this sort of mediocre resume where these poor suckers haven't been trained as well. It, it really makes a difference what an institution does and how well they empower their graduates to, to you know, to sort of make that first step in, into the market. Um, I'm losing my train of thought here. I was going to address something that, that also came up. But anyway, so w what I wanted to say is I think vocational training and academic training can go more, it can prepare people in different ways and can empower them more or less depending on what an institution really does. And I've seen some really top-notch examples where the kids came out really well equipped. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. It, oh, and the second thing I wanted to do, you please. know, if, if, say, if this room were a, a pool of applicants, to me, if you stepped up to the microphone today, you have one and a half shoes in my door, and the ones that didn't step up to the microphone would have to fight harder. Okay. So it's like it's the attitude thing. Right, okay. To me. And you can't necessarily certify that. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Uh, so I came to the web development community after college. I got a degree in psychology and really has not much to do with web development. But um, I got up to speed a little bit extra with online learning with uh, Coursera and uh, Code Academy. And they do give you some kind of like badges, but for me, I think they're more like social media than something I would actually put on my resume okay. or LinkedIn profile. But I don't know if that's something, you know, people are doing these days, or if that's something I should be doing. But kind of a or where that will will yeah. head, or even yeah, just yeah. if that's even respected. Sure, just kind of a comment question. The, the neat thing is that IT right now is the forefront for this. I mean, this is where these conversations are happening uh, around certification and badges and things like that. What is going to be effective um, in, in the near future? I'll just kind of comment from my perspective on, on that pers on the idea of badges and using something like the Khan Academy um, things. And I, I think that would be that you should never rely on those things, at least at this point, to be your resume um, or to be a, a qualification in the same way that you would with a degree, but you really shouldn't hesitate to put that down um, either on your resume or on LinkedIn or whatever else because it's just, it, it can't hurt. It's always one additional point towards you to say, I'm doing more, I'm, you know, this is something else I've accomplished, this is something else I've done. Um, and particularly for a, a developer perspective, a lot of people will look at stuff on GitHub, for example, and not having, like, deciding, to, it's kind of like the equivalent of saying, well, I'm not going to post on GitHub because, you know, I don't think that that's relevant or whatever else. And it's, it's, still, it's still a product of your work that somebody will evaluate. Um, so that's just my perspective. Excellent. Thank you very much. We are out of time, um, but if you would like to continue chatting about this, um, there's a lot of conversations going on at DrupalCon. I'm downstairs on the trade floor. They lock me down there for the rest of the conference. So come say hello, and uh, we can chat some more. Thank you very much.